Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. The text that I would lay upon your hearts this morning comes from Matthew chapter 20. We'll be reading the first 16 verses. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. Dear friends in Christ, fellow redeemed, who's your boss? I think that question could have a number of answers depending on different situations. At work, we all have different people that we have to respond to, different bosses. In home life, when it comes to things like what temperature the thermostat is set at, what's going to be the meal on the table at night, we all have different bosses. I think we can all agree that a boss makes a world of difference in our lives. If you have a bad boss, life can be quite painful. If you have a good boss, life can be quite pleasurable. In God's word for us this morning, Jesus is relating to us a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Within this illustration, Jesus is trying to warn us about Christians who might look down upon other Christians. He's telling us today about how in the kingdom of heaven, God is boss. It's his vineyard, it's his rules, and it's his grace. Now, as you probably remember, the Gospel of Matthew has 28 chapters in it. And here we are in chapter 20 of Matthew, so you might well deduce that we're getting to the end of Jesus' ministry here, and we are. In fact, this parable that Jesus is telling to his disciples, he's telling it as they're on their way from Galilee down to Jerusalem. When he arrives in Jerusalem about a week later, that will be when he is betrayed and arrested and scourged and nailed to the cross and dies. But here he is on the journey with his disciples. And he tells them this parable. It's a parable about one of Jesus' most famous paradoxes. We see it in the last verse of our text. The last will be first, and the first last. This is actually also in the, in the verse right before our text. The very final verse of chapter 19 is the same exact thing. There are many who are first who will be last, and last who will be first. The way that Jesus bookends our parable with this same verse, the same words, indicates to us that this idea is going to be rather important, so we need to keep it in mind. So Jesus begins his parable. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, throughout the New Testament, Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Sometimes we just think of this as being synonymous with heaven. But when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven, he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about all of the things which God does in order to bring people to heaven. The kingdom of God is simply God's ruling authority here on earth amongst us. So what is God's ruling authority like? Well, he tells us in this parable. It's like the master of a house who goes out and finds laborers for his vineyard. So in the kingdom of heaven, God is the boss. 
and we are the employees. Now in the parable, we see that each person received a denarius. A denarius was a, a small silver coin, which in those days was the payment for one day work. A day of, of hard labor received a denarius, a full day's wage. You wouldn't go up and, and get your denarius at the end of the day and say, what, only one silver coin? No, that was what the payment was for a full day of work. You know, a full day of work in, in Jewish time, in, in this time of Jesus, in Jewish uh, lands, was a 12-hour day. To get a denarius, you worked 12 hours from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And if a master was to go out and find workers, he would go out at 5.30 and go and collect his laborers, bring them to his field, and have them work so that he gets his money's worth. So the master in our parable starts out in the ordinary way. He goes out early in the morning, gets the workers, has them start at 6 o'clock. They work till 6 p.m. He gives them a denarius. Then he does something that's rather unusual. He goes back to the streets several other times. He goes at noon. He goes again at 3 p.m. Then he goes lastly at 5 p.m. with only an hour left in the workday. But he still is going out and finding workers to come and work in his field. Highly unusual behavior for a master to go and find people to work for only an hour so that he can give them an entire day's wage. Even more unusual than the master's behavior, I think, is the behavior of the laborers. Each time that the master goes out, he finds the laborers doing what? He says they're standing there idle. Literally not doing anything at all. If you've ever seen uh, films on, on the Great Depression or watched uh, movies that are set in the Great Depression times, when work was very scarce and food was scarce and money was hard to come by, you, you see scenes of, of all the men gathered on the side of the street or gathered at the fence outside the factory begging for some work, begging them to let them in and do some work so that they can put food on the table. You see them running down to the docks and waiting for the boats to come in so they can see if they can get hired for the day. But they're actively searching for work. But these men, these laborers, they're not searching at all. They're just standing there idle, completely content to never work and never get payment. It's a really shocking picture, all the more shocking when you realize that Jesus is painting a picture of us. Here we are, unoccupied, standing idly. Before we came to faith in Christ, we were not looking for him. We were not seeking out a God that we did not know. No, we were totally content to accept whatever came to us, totally content to walk our way through life without knowing God and walking right, into, walking right into hell's doors. We see this in the world around us. Billions of people who do not care about God, who scoff at the idea of heaven or hell, who laugh at the idea of a God, a supreme God over all things, totally content to live for today without thinking about what's going to happen after I die. And we were all like that at one time as well. Like these workers, we had to be approached by God. We had to be invited by God into his kingdom because we were not looking to get in there ourselves. Back in the parable, all is going well for these laborers. They're working, they're working hard, they're doing their due diligence. They've been sent into the vineyard, they've worked all day, and now it's time to get paid. Now we have another interesting thing that the master decides to do. Instead of paying them from the first to the last, as would be normal, he pays them from the last to the first. And more shocking than that is the payment that each receives. Every single person, whether they work 12 hours or one hour, receives the same pay. One denarius, a full day's wage. According to God's rules, the payment for working in the vineyard the payment for being invited into the kingdom of God, it's the same payment for all. One denarius, eternal life. Sounds great, doesn't it? After all, as 1 Timothy 2 says, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Who would ever complain about this generosity by God? Who would ever complain or begrudge God for being nice to people who spent their entire lives and finally heard about him on their deathbed? Who would ever 
be upset about that? Sadly, I think the answer to that is us. Jesus is speaking here about a certain attitude, an attitude of self-righteousness that jealously compares itself to other Christians. He's speaking primarily to the Jews and specifically to the Pharisees who thought that by their works, they were deserving of God's love and eternal life. But he's also speaking to us. He says, how often do we act just like the Pharisees? How often do we act just like those laborers complaining to the boss saying, these last ones worked only one hour and you've made up them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Who among us here today has not had at times similar thoughts? Where you say things like, how is it fair that someone on their deathbed can come to faith and they get the same thing as me? How is it fair that this person can live their entire life enjoying all of the sinful pleasures of life and then here right at the end, they come to faith and repent and they get eternal life just like me? Meanwhile, I was baptized as a child. I grew up in the faith. I spent my entire life trying to resist temptation and I just get the same treatment as them. Every once in a while you hear about a murderer who's on death row, who hears God's word and, and repents and becomes a believer. And we either, we do one of two things. We either say, well, I doubt it. Or we say, how is that fair, God? That they are a murderer and you're treating them the same as you treat me. This is really a sad attitude on our part. Because here on Sunday, we, we sing hymns like, by grace I'm saved, grace free and boundless. We, we talk about how we believe that we are saved by grace alone, something that we don't deserve from God. And yet by our actions and by our attitudes, we betray the notion that, sure, we don't believe we deserve God's love, but we certainly deserve it more than that person over there. Yes, this is a despicable attitude for Christians to have. And it's exactly what Jesus is preaching against here. It's not where we want to be because then the boss has harsh words for those who adopt this attitude. He says, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to, to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? First, it sounds like the boss is being rather cordial and friendly. After all, he does call the man friend. This is not the type of friends you want to be called, though. The Greek word for friend that's used here is found only three different times in the New Testament, all by Jesus. The first is here. The second is just two chapters after this. It's when Jesus is telling the parable of the wedding feast, how he invites all these undeserving people to come to his feast. And yet there he finds a man who's standing without a robe on, without the proper wedding attire. And then the master says to him, friend, how is it that you've gotten in here without the proper wedding garment? And then he casts him out. The third time that Jesus uses this word for friend is when Judas betrays him into the hands of the chief priests and the Sanhedrin. When Judas comes forward and kisses him, Jesus says to Judas, friend, what is it you've done? No, this friend is not the type of friend you want Jesus to to call you by because then the next words are out of his mouth are take what belongs to you and go this is total rejection get out because once we believe that God's grace was somehow deserved by us at least more so than other people deserve it then we have rejected God's grace God is the boss in the kingdom of heaven. It's his rules and it's his grace. And when it comes to living eternally in the physical kingdom of heaven, there's only one rule. It is by grace. God's undeserved love to people who do not deserve to be shown it. Now, as we're reading this, this text, it's rather depressing. 
It shows us some pretty discouraging truths about ourselves. And maybe you're wondering, where's the good news? Where's the gospel? I think you can find it in four small words in verse 14. The master says, I choose to give. That's the good news right there. That God chooses to be generous. It really is grace. It's not something earned. It's not a reward for good behavior. God's love is given as a free gift. God opens heaven's doors simply because he chooses to do it. God forgives your sins, not because you were deserving of it, but simply because he chose to give it to you. God is boss. It's his vineyard, it's his rules, and it's his grace. We read about the last being first and the first being last. We really ought to be last in line for the kingdom of heaven. Especially when you consider that we were not willing to come to God. We had to be dragged there, kicking and screaming. And even after becoming believers, we still tend to have this haughty, puffed-up arrogance about ourselves that thinks, I deserve to be here, and they certainly don't. Yeah, we deserve to be the last through heaven's doors. And yet, it's because of those truths that we are actually who Jesus is referring to when he says the last shall be first. The last are those who come to the Lord knowing that they have nothing to offer him, who come to the Lord with all of their guilt and their grief over their sins, an entire lifetime of regrets. And we come and lay it before the Lord and trust that he has taken care of it, that he's nailed all of that guilt to the cross. Those are the last. And in that way, you are the last. And by God's grace, he chooses to give to you first of all. To help illustrate what this is like, I want you to picture a king, a king who is unmarried and he's searching for his queen. And he goes through all of his kingdom. He's searching high and low and, and meets every eligible woman in the entire land trying to find a wife. And along the way, he meets many beautiful and kind and hospitable and smart and wise women. But none of them are worthy to be his wife. Finally, he goes to the darkest, dank, most dangerous alley in his entire kingdom. There he finds lying in the filthy gutter a dirty, disgusting prostitute. And he reaches down to her and he says, you, I've chosen you to be my queen. That would never happen in real life. And yet that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He came into the world and he was not searching for the wise and the strong and the intelligent. He was not searching for those who were able to rise above temptation. He was not searching for those who were perfect or at least better than everyone else. No, Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom each of us is chief. Jesus came into the world to find the disgusting filth that we are, to draw us out of the darkness of our unbelief, and to call us children of God, not because we earned it, simply because he chose to give it to us. And that is God's grace. Romans 5.20, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. No matter how great our sin, it's never enough to outweigh the grace which God had for us that led him to die and take away our sins. It's God's grace that takes charge. It's God's grace that does all of it. If you look through our text, verse 1, the master of the house went out. Verse 3, he went out again. Verse 5, going out again and again. Verse 6, he went out and found others. It is God who continues to go out and to seek and to find us, not the other way around. It's God who came to us in the waters of our baptism, calling us children of God through it. It's God who comes to us in his body and blood when we partake of the Lord's Supper, granting us forgiveness of sins. It's God who comes to us through his word so that we may be strengthened in our faith by the Holy Spirit, so that we may hear again those reassuring words that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, has cleansed us from all of our sins. 
as God's grace continues to go out to you. God continues to go out into the fields to find you, to bring you back, to ensure that you also will enjoy the bliss of eternal life in heaven. 1 Timothy 1.14 The grace of our, Lord, of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. As God's love for each one of you is overflowing, and now your faith can rest, not in your deserving of God's love, but in the undeserved love which God showed to each one of you. And your hope can rest securely on that love, knowing that it will never change. So who is your boss? In the kingdom of heaven, God is boss. It's his vineyard, and it's his rules, and we ought not to begrudge him for that. It's his grace, and we ought to thank him for that every day of our lives. In the kingdom of heaven, God is boss, and we wouldn't have it any other way. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.